High Castle Space Station, mid-equatorial orbit, Earth. Tuesday, February 20th, 3117. I powered down the spray gun and gave it a slight push toward a waiting freefall mobile unit. I then pulled off my filter mask and stuck it to my chest pad's adhesive tab. The air near the hull had the tang of media delivery volatiles, but it was no longer at toxic levels as the slow movement of exhaust air was drawing the pollutants away. Have I mentioned before how much I hate painting in zero-G? I grumped. Riho stopped playing her tenor rune and replied, Seven times in just the last two hours, John. Are you finished? Finish complaining or finish painting? Either way, yes, it's done. I commanded the motion arm I was riding to retract and pull me up and back to where Riho waited on a portable magnetic gravity cradle. She'd positioned her perch on top of the vessel near the chamber's fresh air feed so that she could play her tenarune unencumbered by a filter mask. Once I reached her position, she detached her cradle and joined me, letting the tentacle-like arm reposition us to near the main entry hatch. I'd needed to use the mechanical anchoring arm because even the tiny thrust from the detail paint sprayer would slowly propel me away from my canvas. And since my current canvas was the curved hull of the L2, our Raider prototype spacecraft, I needed the arm to periodically pull back to inspect my work from all angles. Riho patiently polished her instrument before returning it to its collapsible case. Only after that task was done did she look up and inspect the completed artwork. I am intrigued by the symbolism, John, she commented. Also, the style is unlike that which you usually paint. It's a form of folk art, almost sophisticated graffiti. Back in pre-reset times, when my species warred with one another, such images were painted onto the crafts they would fly into battle. It's called nose art. Because it was commonly painted on the front end of such craft, the Hemru asked. That's correct. Riho studied the image for a bit longer. The caption, The Last Laugh, is the reason you've begun calling this vessel L2? She asked. I nodded. I assume the name has deeper meanings other than humor? Yes, I explained. It's an ironic shortening of an old saying. He who laughs last, laughs best. The last, best laugh, at least in this case, belongs to the victor. The depiction is an attempt to illustrate that for the enemy, this will be its utter end, and only the victor, hopefully us, will be a laughing when it's done. My nose art rendition for the deception craft was not as original as I'd have liked. It was based upon similar nose art which had adorned at least two versions of strategic bomber once employed by my former country, the good old U.S. of A. In the original nose art, an evilly grinning, card-playing, jester clown was depicted showing his hand by tossing it down in front of his unknown adversary. Each of the four revealed cards displayed the image of a single, large atom bomb. The message was clear, four-of-a-kind hand of doom an almost unbeatable surprise knockout combination. I'd taken the original art as my inspiration, but altered it in two notable ways. The first was that I had replaced the grinning jester clown with an equally grinning familiar black android clown figure instead. I'd also replaced the large bombs displayed on each of the cards with an electric blue glowing lightning bolt. I used my implant to transfer the digital image of the original nose art which I'd been using as a guide to Riho, and explained, that's the art I base this rendition on. She was silent as she compared the archival image file to the physical work in front of her. The meaning behind your substitutions is clear. This craft will be piloted and the attack launched by your AI. The change to include the maniacal representation of Omu to represent the AI is adequate. Also, the electric bolt image on the card signifies correctly that the doom delivered onto your enemy will not be physical weaponry, but instead a rampant, self-replicating digital sentience. You nailed it, I replied, hiding any sarcasm at her overly clinical analysis. I think it turned out well, I explained. It's too bad we can't leave it visible. Naomi would be covering the entire frontal area of the spacecraft in a 40 millimeter thick coating of spray-applied ablator. This might protect L2 from a few seconds of enemy energy weaponry in case they shot first before asking questions upon our arrival. The AI had also explained that leaving my nose art visible would, at the very least, confuse the enemy. 
At worst, the assemblage AI could derive some meaning and become suspicious. The ablator would hide the art nicely. At Riho's questioning look, I explained, the enemy might deduce its meaning if we left it visible. But why expend the effort to paint the image in the first place if it will only be hidden away? She asked, confused. Well, I wanted to do it for the good of my soul, I explained. It's hard for me to explain, but understand that the effort makes me feel at ease about my contribution. It's also a way to honor the previous human world that the enemy destroyed. Naomi will render the nose art fully visible in any imagery disseminated to humans. I was wise enough to not add an additional reason of merchandising, which had just popped into my head. I doubted the Hemru had enough foundation in our visual comedies to be familiar with the works of Mel Brooks. The joke would only confuse her further, and I did not want to attempt to explain the reference. We were silent after that. Riho continued to inspect my painting while I admired the rest of the craft. I was proud of how it had turned out. It really did resemble a modified Titan II missile. The reason we'd kept that long, slender plan form was because of the limits of the recently rebuilt Phobos wormhole. To shave off repair time, it had been rebuilt with an intermediate, smaller diameter wormhole generator than it had been originally equipped with. The reduced capacity main coil would now only pass a four and a half meter diameter object. Three months from now, a larger replacement coil will be completed, which would be slightly bigger than the original. After that upgrade, the improved Phobos wormhole would pass objects nearly eight meters in diameter. The reason for the intermediate step was twofold. The first was that, as I already explained, just hunt on endum. We would have Phobos back in operation an entire month sooner than previously planned. The second reason was that after installing the upgraded final coil, the temporary would be safely stored nearby to serve as a reserve in case of another accident. Even further into the future, a second aiming gantry would be constructed just for the spare and Phobos would have a dual ultra-long-range wormhole capability. At just under four meters in diameter, we'd size the last laugh so as to be deliverable by the intermediate wormhole. And with Phobos back in operation sooner, we would even use the wormhole to transport L2 instantly from here on High Castle Space Station to Phobos, thus saving us interplanetary shipping delays. This wormhole transfer was scheduled to happen by the end of the week, hence tonight's late-night painting session. As this could very well be the final time I physically saw this deception ship, I was also saying goodbye. If it arrived at Phobos, it would be stored, ready to go in a nearby cavern until we used it. Since that deployment could happen at any time, and as I did not have any plans on returning to Mars in the near future, tonight was sayonara. I said if it arrived because we were using the shipment of the deception vessel as an early test of the newly operational intermediate-sized wormhole. With any new bit of complex technology, something could go wrong. And if it did and L2 was lost, Naomi had already started construction on an L3. I assume the digital picket mind data copy you will be sending along with the last laugh is unaware of this Anoz art you've adorned its ship with, Riho asked. I thought back to the virtual picket we'd visited in the iterations of the simulated reality project where he and the master AI had built the ship after discovering hyperdrive propulsion. Built, to use the term loosely, as he was simply near the top of the pyramid of human template workers and AI-controlled mobile units. Well, the mind data version going with this ship will remember that it was painted in celebration colors to honor the still-living template humans, but not the actual image I've just finished. Dionys AI will have altered Pickett's memories to hide what I've just dabbed. I thought back to my visit into the simulated reality project, to observe Pickett in the altered iteration. I'd viewed three periods of the most promising iteration. The first was just after Naomi had created the iteration with the altered parameters. The others, including Riho, had gone with me as it was simply an interactive viewing of recorded fake history. Because it was a replay, we were passive observers only, overflying one of the more populated industrial areas of the simulated alternate Earth. The time period we witnessed would have been a year after Pickett's arrival via interstellar transmission. In the iteration, the master AI was in firm control of the system and was following the directives Pickett had just delivered from the Ark. That being the immediate embarkation on a system-wide industrial program to build and launch the second Ark. 
The simulated Earth we saw in the iteration was a hellish quagmire of pollution and heavy industrialization. The air was nearly unbreathable due to the blast mining, processing, and toxic refining. Even with breathing filters, there was enough radiation in the environment from the liberal use of nuclear mining charges to be lethal in long exposures. Dionys reported that the remaining human population, the template human colonies, were dying off in high numbers. Others had been incorporated into the industrializing effort. When I saw what they'd become, I was reminded of the Borg from Star Trek, although the implants and cybernetics were more for life sustainment than augmentation. Hannah had agreed and also remarked that the simulated Earth now resembled a few of the better-known dystopian futures from science fiction novels or movies. Aside from the pollution and wrecked ecosystem, the alternative simulated Earth did have something very intriguing and something which the real Earth lacked, a pair of working space elevators. As we overflew the one based in the Andes Mountains, Omu explained that they had been built to cheaply transport large quantities of art construction materials to orbit. When I asked her why the AIs had never pushed to build such an elevator system on the real Earth, Omu explained that up until recently, the low human population had not required one. Also, with the discovery and rapid implementation of wormhole technology, an orbital elevator would now likely never be needed, even factoring in the current high energy needed for using the spatial portals. Our second simulation visit was far more intimate. In this viewing, our group of observers took the points of view of template laborers working in one of the master AI's science research and production facilities. Our current project had been the task of building an improved anti-proton energy distribution manifold for the future ARCS acceleration boosters. We watched as a simulated augmented cyborg made the leap of intuition that resulted in the warp drive breakthrough. I noticed that Ux had an almost haunted expression as she witnessed the simulated event. News of the breakthrough rapidly spread through the iteration and further experiments were begun to confirm the new technology. Gnasium and Dionys AIs had carefully embedded into the simulated iteration the fundamentals of two real-world breakthroughs. The first was the method used to produce spatial distorting exotic matter. The second was a very contrived hand wobbium method to allow that energized matter to pull along the machinery in any attached space vessel through warped space. The latter was compounded by the fact that such a method did not and could not exist. The AIs had to develop a complicated persistent virus-like algorithm that would force any simulated intelligence in the iteration which studied the impossible science to think that it was understandable and viable. Because of this redacting virus, each intelligence, all the way up to the simulated master AI, simply knew that the technology worked. It was a masterpiece of layered fakery in an already fake simulation. I could hardly believe we were seriously contemplating sending our fake spaceship to the enemy to attempt to convince it to believe such a layer cake of lies. But in the SRP iteration, Pickett and the master AI were convinced, and that was enough. Dionys then influenced them into seeking to return this new miracle technology back to their assemblage creators. What better way to quickly send back the news than on a warp drive starship built to exploit that very miracle technology to save space and resources? And because there was no need, there would be no physical crew on board, just a large data archive that would include one mind data copy of the enemy's operative, Picket. Ix had remained upset when we returned to the virtual lobby after leaving the second visit to the SRP iteration. I'd taken her aside to talk in private, and at first she had not wanted to discuss it. But being a stubborn, cantankerous bastard at times has its usefulness, and I was able to get her to open up. John, she'd sobbed, do you think I've made myself into a monster? Like those altered template humans we saw in the simulation? Ux, honey, I'd said softly. You of all people know that physical appearance means little in this day and age. Anyone can alter their appearance at will, and what matters is what's inside. I think the augment implants you wear make you look brave and devoted. You make me proud and I know that the kids feel the same. She had sobbed quietly for a minute while I virtually held her. Finally, she recovered and we made our goodbyes. After she was gone, I asked Naomi and Dionys why the AIs had depicted augmented humans as being the method to inject the discovery of the fake warp drive technologies into the simulation. 
Had it been some misguided attempt to honor Yuxi, who'd made a similar breakthrough with wormholes in real life? The AIs had replied that it needed a human being to be part of the discovery chain as the master AI was incapable of the leaps of intuition required. They pointed out that much as it had taken the augmented UX to discover wormhole theory, they needed something similar in the SRP. It was too unlikely that any true AI would have researched such impossible theories on its own. Yux had not joined the group for the final, third visit to the iteration. The timeline of the iteration had been adjusted so that it was nearly in line with reality, and we watched from one of the orbital shipyards as the new warp drive vessel left Earth orbit. It was strange seeing a spaceship that looked exactly like our last laugh, leaving under master AI control. Of course, the fake iteration ship had to look similar to the one we'd built, as we needed Pickett's memories of its construction to match. The simulated launch imagery would also be included in the records of the real physical L2, as it would have received radio traffic up until it went into warp. Dionys attempted to explain how it had manipulated events in the simulation to direct the ship's design, which I mostly tuned out. What had caught my eye was that three of the iterations fell apart as the simulated AIs in each diverged from reality too far. That was why Naomi had started as many versions as it had. Immediately after the simulated warp ship left our system, the iteration froze and we were ejected into the virtual lobby. The simulation would remain paused unless and until we needed it again. Why would we need it? Well, if something went wrong with the real physical L2, we would need a simulated viable reason to build the L3. The iteration could then be booted back up in a replacement ship justified, along with another version of the dupe picket. I was glad when the visits into the simulations were over, as they had been surreal and creepy. There was too much fakery and with overexposure one started doubting what was real. I suspected we would all have a nightmare or two in the near future resulting from our visit. The kind where we would doubt that we were in actual reality. Heels in the Sand Island, Earth. Friday, February 23rd, 3117. I was wondering when I would be hearing from you, Jonathan quipped. You think you know me so well? I responded instantly. We were speaking the old way, not in virtual, but with video screens. I was currently in my island workshop, which had been converted into a makeshift apartment for our short stay. Serenity had fully taken over the upper lust, and we'd not wanted to intrude. Outside, the rare morning rain was increasing in strength as an even rare morning thunderstorm descended upon the island. Riho was down at the far end of the North Beach in the indoor activities pavilion, busy entertaining the island's guests with her music and stories. My closest brother just grinned a moment before turning serious. By the way, great job with the nose art on the last laugh. Thank you for sending me the imagery. No problem. I knew you of all people would appreciate it as much as me. He just nodded. Despite his altered memories, like me, Jonathan still remembered most of his childhood. This included having been raised a child of the Cold War, when the original nose art had been flown proudly and often. How are things on Vesta? I asked delaying bringing up the main reason I'd contacted him. Very good. We've been keeping Sarissa busy sending through flagpoles every three or four days. The only downside to that is that we seem to be suffering under a constant energy shortage. Most of the residents are getting used to it, though. They've even renamed the gravity habitat the night train because of the reduced lighting. While the war was paused, we were using Sarissa to send flagpole scouting probes to each of the eight notable star systems within its current range of nine light years. Why call them flagpoles? Well, to fit a decent sized space based astronomical telescope through a wormhole that can only pass an object 15 centimeters in diameter, we needed to make them narrow and very, very long, just like a flagpole. So far, since the Phobos accident, we'd sent at least two survey probes to each star system. Even the Red Dwarf Flare Stars Wolf to 359, Barnard Star, and the Brown Dwarf Wise 08550714. We'd send four probes to the Sirius system and five to Alpha Centauri, with three of those targeting Rigel Centaurus, the most sun-like star in that trinary system. Important data was beginning to trickle back from the deployed probes as the busy Sarissa revisited each system every few weeks for updates. I had mixed feelings about the exploration effort. Despite the wealth of new knowledge, the survey campaign siphoned resources from the war effort. 
The flagpole missions were a compromise between the pro-war faction and exploration first faction. The latter arguing that with Phobos down and with the Sarissa wormhole free for research, why not use it? They were already pushing for time on the rebuilt Phobos mechanism to send through bigger scouts and even colonizer auto factories. Won't the new fusion plant being constructed help with the power situation when it comes online? I asked. We were using the downtime to increase Vesta's base fusion power generation capacity. Doing so would eliminate the need for using the Supplemental Energy Atomic Dynamo space station orbiting the asteroid, thus freeing up its fissionable fuel for use at Mars. It should, but I predict they will simply use Sarissa more when the additional power production becomes available, Jonathan explained. But all this chatter is not the reason you contacted me. You want my advice? Well, all-knowing one, please answer the question or questions you think I'm going to ask, I dared. Yes, yes, and maybe, he said smugly. I just smiled and shook my head. Okay, how about this then, he continued. Yes, acid rain is still ready to go. Yes, I think we will end up having to use it. And maybe we can use it without harming anyone on Vesta or compromising our artificial intelligences system-wide. I was impressed as this was very close to what I'd wanted to discuss. That almost works. Although my second question wasn't if you think acid rain will ever be needed. It was actually, should we use it right now? Jonathan pursed his lips and whistled. You want to use it now? Why? What have you learned? Well, not right now now, but soon. And it's not anything new we've learned. Just more of a gut feeling, I replied uneasily. Maybe I fear that the exploration factions will overcome the war faction and we will lose our chance? After a pause, I continued, I wish I knew why I am leaning so strongly this way. Maybe I should be asking you why I feel so strongly about using acid rain right away. He was silent for a long time. That's a hard question to answer. I've, no, we have always had good gut instincts. It's served me well over the centuries, as I know it's served you also. I realize we can't use it right this minute. For one, we have to finish the upgrades to the Vesta power infrastructure, I explained. That will take at least two more weeks. The other reason is we would need to evacuate a substantial portion of Vesta's inhabitants. Why would using acid rain be dependent upon having the new fusion plant fully operational? Jonathan asked. After all, we still have the atomic dynamo satellite standing by. We've altered the final design of the fake hyperdrive, I explained. Sarissa will have to be active for the duration the last laugh is in assemblage space. At his inquisitive look, I went on to explain in detail how we had revised the operational plan for the false hyperdrive aboard the last laugh. Instead of the original concept of claiming the ship dumped its hyperdrive engine before arriving in the vicinity of the Ark out of caution, we were now leaving it in place, and to provide a reason for it being non-functional, we would use the excuse that it had depleted its exotic matter fuel. The empty fuel tank also gave us enough empty volume on board Last Laugh in which to anchor a continuous eight-light-year-long Sarissa Microcom wormhole link. The link would remain active at all times, shifting its terminus in real time as the Last Laugh was maneuvered in close and hopefully docked with the enemy arc. Despite the constant high-energy input requirements, there were many benefits to this plan. The first was that the active wormhole link would provide instant feedback so we would know when the enemy began attempting to decrypt Last Laugh's data archives. Secondly, the active spatial distortion generated by the micro-wormhole would be detectable by the enemy. The strange energy distortions would help sell the idea that the Last Laugh did have a working hyperdrive. The unexplained distortion waves would hopefully make them cautious enough to not immediately start dismantling the deception vessel in order to probe its inner workings. Finally, the constantly active microlink would allow for a great pathway to feed real-time surveillance and sensor data back to Earth. It would be expected that a hyperspace vessel would have a robust sensor suite. These would be kept operating as the last laugh was brought in close to the enemy we would have nearly instant access to this valuable intelligence. So the real reason for the new fusion power plan is not to ease Vesta's energy shortage, but to allow Sarissa to maintain this constant eight light year long link. Jonathan summarized. Pretty much now it is, I replied. 
Although construction had started long before we knew we needed the constant wormhole, fissionable fuel is becoming too valuable, and what we have is better used at Phobos to power the larger wormhole. Fusion is more reliable, too. If we use dynamo power, we'd run an increased risk of power supply disruption. That would be fatal to the deception mission, as there would be no way to re-establish an accurate link once it was very near the arc. What about the dangers of the assemblage discovering the active Sarissa wormhole? Jonathan asked next. I thought that was why the deception ship was to have the fake hyperdrive. That is the risk, I admitted, nodding thoughtfully. But the encrypted archives on board L2 will contain no real data about our wormholes, and the exotic matter storage tank where the micro-wormhole terminus will be targeted will be sealed. We will know instantly if the enemy begins to tamper with the tank. If they risk it, we will immediately shut down the wormhole and scuttle the ship. Can we do that reliably? Jonathan asked soon. The plan is that if we need to destroy the L2 just before the wormhole is shut down, we'll send through a capsule of exotic antimatter. A few grams, but enough to fully vaporize the last laugh and all the evidence of our deception attempt with it. Jonathan whistled. Exotic antimatter. I bet that cost a pretty penny. No shit, I replied. Hopefully we won't need to resort to using that option. Exotic antimatter was very, very costly and difficult to produce. We only had a few dozen grams in existence and lacked the resources to quickly make more. Why would we waste it to destroy the deception ship? Well, it reacted with normal matter in very strange ways, not a typical annihilation as half the energy released went into some as-of-yet unknown subspace realm. Again, this worked in our favor as the assemblage would have no idea what to make of the fallout from the explosion. The partially sentient autopilot AI on board the ship will be screaming to the assemblage to not mess with its fuel tank, I explained. Even better, the encrypted data archives are partially embedded into the tank structure, making safe separation virtually impossible. At least, that's what we are hoping. Making the deception ship explode was our fallback recourse for many possible ways the plan could fail. Naomi had already started on the replacement vessels for future missions, as the odds were high that our first attempt would fail. The plan was that if the first ship was scuttled, we'd simply wait a few months and try again. The picket version on board the next deception ship would simply report that the Earth had given up waiting for a reply from the first ship and assuming the worst, had built and sent a second. There could even be a third or fourth, as many as needed, really, until one worked as intended. So, two weeks until the fusion plant is in operation here on Vesta, I assume the last laugh made it to Phobos? Yes, well, I replied. The intermediate wormhole was first activated yesterday morning. After a series of tests, it poked the last laugh through to Phobos late last night. Once through the wormhole aperture, three of Naomi's big space tugs grabbed it and transported it into the waiting storage silo. The whole operation barely took 20 minutes. Jonathan had a sudden far-off look. He was probably contemplating how wormhole tech would have made his mission of the last century so much easier. How long will it take to get it ready to deploy to Ark Space if you give the word? he asked after returning from his recollections. An hour would be optimal, assuming that the dynamos have sufficient fissionable fuel in reserve. I am guessing that you've mandated that a minimum reserve be maintained at all times? I just smiled. Jonathan thought too much like me at times. Well, he said with a sigh, I'll probably take some time off for the next week or two. It's likely to get interesting after that. I've not yet decided, I growled. Besides, Ux thinks we should wait. Well, don't you have yourself a pickle, he replied, clearly amused. You need one of us to turn the activation key with you. I just spread my hands in reply, not bothering to reply verbally. He smiled wider. I honestly don't know, John. To vote against Yuke's intellect is quite a big deal, after all. What about your gut instinct? I asked. Let me think about it. So decisive, I see, I said sarcastically. He just shook his head, grinning. Call me again if you need to talk. He then terminated the vid, but not before I caught his wink. The ongoing storm had continued to grow stronger. I suspected that Riho would be forced to remain down at the beach pavilion until well afternoon. Omu chose that moment to enter the workshop from the rear kitchenette. She was bearing a cup of tea, which I accepted with thanks. 
Serenity reports that she will remain down at the pavilion with the ambassador until the storm subsides. I just nodded and sipped my tea. Omu then knelt next to me, saying nothing. The silence continued long after I had finished my cup. I just don't know what to do, Omu, I finally admitted almost ten minutes later. If you would only decide to vote, you would break the current impasse. Ux might then change her mind, or I'll relax and be okay with waiting. My vote is not required, John, Omu replied. The votes of the others also matter little in the end. Remember your daughter's instructions to you from long ago. I thought of Abby and her first mandate to me. But if I decide to go ahead, I'll still need either Jonathan or Uxi to agree in order to activate Acid Rain. That is true, Omu replied. But that is only required for that one aspect of the campaign. What would happen if you unilaterally ordered that the last laugh be sent, though? I considered the android's statement. I could send the L2 deception ship to the Ark on my own. Sarissa would be attached via micro-wormhole as planned. Once the enemy linked with L2 and began to decrypt the fake data, we would either have to trigger acid rain or blow up the ship. If faced with that choice, would Ux choose the latter and let the whole effort go to waste? That would be a very shitty thing to do, Omu. Even if Ux agreed to trigger acid rain, she'd hate me forever for forcing her hand in that way. I have learned that human emotions are ever flexible. Also, the expression, it is, it is sometimes better to beg for forgiveness after than seek permission before, is apartment. Consider the two main outcomes of using acid rain. If its use is successful and the enemy threat is neutralized, forgiveness will be almost assured. If the attempt fails, then there will be bigger problems to deal with. The android had flashed her digital grin at the last. I caught the warning in her statement, a reminder of the reality of the matter and also that there were very non-trivial risks involved. We remained silent as I thought. Outside my workshop, the sky had grown dark as the heart of the thunderstorm cell passed over the island. Thunder peals rolled almost continuously and the periodic lighting illuminated the swaying palms lining the path to the beach. I hoped Serenity had been keeping up with maintaining the lightning arrestor gear on the island's higher points. Oh, Moo, what are the current weather conditions at the Bluefields Memorial Preserve? Current conditions are calm, humid, and 24 degrees. The android replied instantly. It was always warm and humid in the Central American jungles. At least it was not raining. It would also be well after dark. What time is it there? Fifteen minutes before midnight, Omu replied. If you are considering traveling to the memorial, note that there is currently one other visitor in attendance. Shall I have them escorted from the area? I did want to visit the memorial. As always, I was amazed at how perceptive the AIs were of my desires. Yes, I want to visit, and no, do not bother the other visitor. I won't be there long enough to draw a crowd, and I can handle one person, even if they are intrusive. Omu fetched my pair of slip-on shoes, explaining that the grounds around the memorial were still damp from a recent, unseasonable rain shower. Querencia is standing by to fulfill our transport needs. Portal formation will occur in nine seconds. Stand by. Naomi had been using her interplanetary ranged High Castle wormhole to assist with the reconstruction efforts ongoing on Mars and elsewhere, so it often needed to recharge its energy reserves. The shorter range Carencia wormhole was adequate for my emergency use as long as I was on Earth. I watched its smaller terminus appear in the open area of my shop. I considered messaging Riho, but left it as I'd likely be back before she noticed I had left the island. Shepherdess Memorial, near Bluefields, Nicaragua. 2344 local time. Moments later, Corencia's compact transport cylinder opened, and I stepped out into the sultry darkness of the rainforests of eastern Nicaragua. My first thought upon seeing the grounds of the memorial was one of guilt, as it had been more than a half a century since the last time I'd visited. That last occasion had been when Charity had turned seven, old enough to learn the true history and details of her family's lineage. The monument preserve looked much as I remembered from previous visits, timeless as only a cared-for memorial could be. I'd arrived near the juncture of the statue circle in the paved access path, which led back towards the old field base to the east. I scanned down that road which led to the nearest habitation and transportation center and thought about how it had changed over the century and a half since the place was built, where originally the paved trail had been centered on a wide clearing in the jungle. It was now more intimate, 
almost sinister. No longer open to the sky, the illuminated roadway bore through the overgrown forest like a twisting, serpentine, four-meter diameter tunnel. The lighting came from the herbicidal barrier membrane that formed the arched tunnel and prevented the jungle's intrusion. The surface of this barrier glowed slightly luminescent with slowly shifting colors. I'd once heard that the kilometer-long jungle tunnel was now almost as big of a tourist draw as the main monument itself. Where previously most of the memorial's visitors had come in the daytime, now the majority visited after dark simply to walk the magical trail and witness the colorful illumination. But as it was now near midnight local time, any crowds were long gone. In fact, from where I was standing, I couldn't see anyone else, despite Omu's warning that there was one other visitor present. Quirencia's transport cylinder emerged a second time from the still-active portal and disgorged Omu. The android had not asked to follow, but with the presence of the soul stranger, it made sense. Omu moved to the edge of the path and stood silent, not wishing to intrude on my reasons for visiting. I finally turned to face the monument and took in the statue of my long-departed daughter, Abby. My breath caught just as it had the first time I had seen the memorial and as it had on every visit since. The platinum statue was raised on a perfectly hemispherical mound covered with small blue-white faceted stones. The well-lit figure of the twice life-size rendition of my daughter stood at the pinnacle of the mound. Abby's pose was resolute, facing east towards the future sunrise and leaning forward as if bracing herself against a gale. Her right arm was up, extended with her palm upward into that wen, as if holding our enemies at bay. Omu followed at a distance as I began to walk slowly around the illuminated perimeter circular path to where I could better see Abby's face. The expression that came into view was one of grim determination, if somewhat sad. As I took in her face with its regal features, powerfully almost repressed, or maybe partially forgotten, memories flooded my consciousness. I felt my throat tighten even further as tears began to stream down my face. After I recovered, I finally noticed from this vantage the other visitor further around the circle. He or she was kneeling on the pavement next to a pair of small burning candles. From the currently deactivated rain deflector still deployed near the candles, whoever it was had been there a while. The figure's eyes shifted to me briefly so I knew that they were aware of my presence. Curiosity got the better of my emotions, so I slowly made my way around to where the figure knelt, as if in vigil. As I approached, I noticed from the guttering candlelight that the figure was both fully nude and bald. With the constant balmy temperatures and the active insect suppression around the monument grounds, one could get away without clothing. On top of the figure's bowed bald head, I was able to see the slightly iridescent tattoos. They signified that the person was an androgynous null, neither a he nor a she, or even a hermaphrodite. Nullism meant that this person's shell was sexless, lacking any sexually functional genitalia at all. I looked closely using my iris's zoom feature and saw that the tattoo signifier was missing the expected pronoun designation. With they being incorrect for a null and without a listed designation, he was leaving the choice of pronoun up to me in this case. I chose he due to personal preference and impulse, but it was clear that the null cared little either way. True nullism is very rare as it went against all the population increasing measures put in place after the reset. Only now was it beginning to be openly tolerated. Nullism also meant that this person was likely very old, having chosen to be reshelled in this form only after living a lifetime or two as a normal binary. Good evening, the figure said quietly, head now raised and tracking my approach. He then nodded toward Omu, who had remained at a distance. To you also, I replied. I'm John. The Null's eyes widened slightly at my declaration, clearly recognizing who I was, but he remained silent. I apologize for my curiosity, but are you on a vigil of some sort? I asked while gesturing towards the Null's kneeling stance and burning candles. The figure straightened up, but did not stand. Instead, it settled back comfortably on his haunches. I was reminded of the primitive tribal members I'd met during my visits to the Amazon Preserve. They could squat like this all day long without complaint. This stance also confirmed that his shell was truly sexless, no nipples and just a small slit at his groin for urination. 
You may call me disciple, the null said. He then gestured to the guttering candles in front of him. It is my night to attend the vision. The null had accentuated attend as if it were some sort of explanation. Do you worship Ab, er, this shrine? I asked, stopping at the last instant from saying my daughter's name. The figure grinned. No, John Prime, I'm fully aware that your daughter, the shepherdess, was just another human like us all and was no goddess. No, I am here to attend the vision, the desire for humanity to remain free from all external oppressors. Omu, I queried subvocally, you are safe. The attenders are some of your strongest proponents. They are firmly on the pro-war side as well. The android answered via my implant. I had not been aware of these attenders. They must have been a new group and few in number. But I also understood from that lack of awareness, the AIs did not consider the group a threat. I was not aware of your group. Are there many of you? Disciple smiled. No, less than a dozen. However, we do have almost a hundred periodic viewers on our Conscientia subchannel. Twenty are online and viewing from my perspective right now. I was uncool enough to wave. Disciple was polite enough to not react. Are all attenders nullists like you? I asked next. In for a penny and all that. He smiled. No, it is not a requirement in order to attend. Despite our paltry few, there is one other like me. However, that is more due to with our shared history than in any proclaimed policy. Are you here every night? Oh, no, he replied. This would become tedious very quickly. One of us attends here only once a month when there is a new moon leaving the shepherdess in full darkness. And just so you think we are not all completely crazy, we only stay until midnight. We retain a least public isolation lodge near the old field base where we can retire until we arrange transport back to where we live. Most of us attend during our required isolation period. I nodded as if I understood, but I'd have to follow up with Omu later. With our brief introductions concluded, an awkward silence fell after that. Disciple returned to its kneeling position and began to mutter something too softly to overhear. I moved away a few dozen meters to where my daughter's memorial plaque was planted. The metal was bright and shiny in the glow of a pair of ground lights. I mimicked Disciple and knelt, tracing my fingers over my daughter's epitaph. Here lies Abby Abrams Branco, shepherdess of humanity, during the darkness and daughter of Anna Branco and John Abrams, prime. Born November 20th, 2602. Died September 13th, 2953. Age 350 years, 10 months, 242 years spent awake and active. I confirmed the math, and yes, it really had been 164 years since she had died. The math also confirmed that at my current subjective age of 240 years, I was still two years younger than Abby had been when she'd ceased living. She'd grown tired of the struggle and embraced her death at the end. Was I growing tired like she had? Midnight arrived and passed as I continued kneeling and thinking in front of the memorial. I was too far lost in memories and melancholy to notice Disciple approaching beside me. Omu buzzed my implant, bringing me out of my contemplations, just as the Null spoke. I knew your daughter when she was still alive, he said softly. I'd assumed you were a former tribe member from the ease at which you sat back on your haunches earlier, I said, rising stiffly to my feet and turning to face the attender. Yes, an old habit, Disciple replied. This new world you have built is one of chairs, John. I find it hard to believe that, back in the time of your birth, a good portion of humanity squatted instead of sat. You speak without any sign of a tribal accent, I commented. I left that life long ago, soon after your daughter left hers. I felt the call of the technological world beyond the Amazon and fled the preserve. Later, I received an AI education and spent the next 20 years in space helping build the original Vesta shipyard and colony. I then assisted in the construction of the Sovereigna. When it launched towards the Eta Cassiopeia, a copy of my mind data was with the 200 sent with it. The Null had smiled briefly when it had mentioned the starship's destination. He was well-versed in history, indeed to know of my gaffe in causing the star system to be renamed to Akird. I also realized that with his background, I'd likely met Disciple before, as I had spent some time with the construction workers and future crew candidates before Sovrana had departed. 
I was too polite to inquire directly and too honorable to have Omu or Naomi report the Null's full lineage. From the relatively young age of disciples' current Null shell, his change had to have happened recently. I'd leave it up to him to share the details with me, if he wanted. As if reading my mind, the Null said, We have met twice before, but it has been over a century. Thank you for not inquiring, but really it does not matter. My past is unremarkable, and I prefer to now just look forward. We began walking as we talked, slowly circling the monument mound as it returned to the junction with the tunnel path leading back to the field base. Even though you say that I would not have remembered you as you were, I am still impressed that you volunteered to travel to the hardship colony, I said. Sovrana had been sent to Akird as a worst-case scenario. Eta Cassiopeia was both a flare star and much further away from the Earth than more likely candidates. The thought at the time was that if Saul fell to the assemblage, any nearby star systems would also soon be at risk. Akird was further away and undesirable for habitation. Both offered breathing room for any human colony established there. Being a flare star meant that it was inhospitable to life as we knew it. The humans who arrived at Akird would face incredible hardships, not only in building a colony, but a continuing struggle just to keep everyone fed and healthy. With those grim realities in mind, the starship had been sent with additional supplies to increase its chances. It was capable of building a space-based society in the asteroids of Achird, or even possibly completely underground, safe from flare radiation on one of the image rocky worlds. One positive result, though also one not mentioned in polite conversation, was that if our enemies did take Saul in the nearby systems, and if the humans sent to Akird survived and prospered, they would be tough sons of bitches. Vengeance might be a long time in the making for the Earth, but it could conceivably come in the form of hell soldiers from a Kurd. If I may ask, Disciple asked carefully, bringing me back from remembering the desperate glory days of Sovrana's creation. Do you visit your daughter's memorial often? Not often enough, I replied soberly. I then went on to explain how long ago it had been since my last visit. Then I am fortunate to be attending on the night on which you chose to pay homage. We reached the juncture. Disciple began walking towards the glowing jungle tunnel, but paused when he noticed that Omu and I were not following. You are staying here? Yes, transport will meet us here shortly, I replied. Disciple returned and offered his hand. His grip was firm, but the shell felt feminine, enough so that I had to mentally remind myself that I'd chosen a male pronoun. It was nice to meet and speak with you again, John. I hope your visit here helped you find what you were looking for, Disciple said. How did you know I was here seeking something? I asked. I assumed you were seeking comfort in the memories of your daughter. Was that not the case? Well, yes, partially. I have a big decision to make and was hoping for help from the past, I explained. The Null had a curious look and gestured for me to continue. I am faced with a very unpopular choice. It's risky and dangerous but could save countless lives, I said cautiously. I'm not sure how to proceed. The Null started laughing. I mean, really laughing, almost bending over. This went on for long enough that I began to laugh with him. Finally, we recovered. John Prime, I laugh because when have you not faced an unpopular decision that has threatened us all? The Null had a point. I thought back to my risky, unauthorized use of the Forbin complex. I also remembered deciding to force the offensive against the enemy to proceed despite calls to wait. I'd gone against both the will of the AIs and the majority of humanity many times before. I guess from your point of view, it might look funny. Do you hate me for it? Of course not, John. I am an attender. We fully support your right to decide. You want me to rule? I asked, surprised and curious. For now, yes. But we know that nothing is forever. When it is the right time, we know you will step aside, either from rule or from the boredom of living. At my frown, the Null hesitated, as if considering how to continue. Finally, he gestured towards the monument. Do you remember when you first met your daughter? Well, I think so. It was a long time ago. We attenders have memorized much of that first exchange. Do you remember what was discussed just before you and Uxe Esperanza left the Amazon? I shook my head. The records state that your daughter confronted you with this question, Father. You are now Lord and Master of this world. What will you do? 
The Null had spoken the quote with a decent imitation of my daughter's voice, as it had when I'd heard it almost two centuries ago. Hearing Abby's words rocked me to my core. Disciple went on, Do you remember how you replied? I think I asked her what I should do. Yes, he said with a gleam in his eyes, just like what you asked her by coming here tonight. Had I come seeking answers from my daughter's memories? Maybe I had. Your daughter's answer to you back then is the foundation of our belief as attenders, John. She had told you to rule, through subtle means at times, or through direct dominance at others. You must similarly rule this world. I was too stunned to answer. Surely it could not be that simple. Your daughter trusted you back then, John. Most of humanity trusts you now, and we attenders wholeheartedly do so. You must trust in yourself. You would not be here if you were not worthy of such trust. Disciple studied my shocked expression for a moment before nodding. He then smiled and turned to leave without saying anything further. I just stood there dumbfounded. I finally glanced at Omu, who just shrugged. The null began whistling as he walked away, swinging his satchel of gear casually, as if amused by life. Just before he entered the jungle tunnel entrance, the null stopped and turned. John! The null yelled back. Whatever you decide, don't leave it to the directors. Some of those guys are dicks, especially that Karn Conlon fellow. Disciple then disappeared around the bend in the tunnel. Once he was gone, I turned to Omu. Tell me you did not set this up somehow? Yes, John, the android said while rolling its digital eyes. Naomi and I created the entire encounter. In fact, you are not really here at all. In reality, you are asleep and dreaming, plugged into a battery pod covered in ooze. All right, all right. Just checking, I said chuckling. Still, it was an amazing coincidence, if I must say. I will say, Omu said smugly, that the null human seemed very intelligent and rational. You might consider doing away with your gonads as well. Naomi, I spoke loudly into the air. Pick up, please, for one. <laughs>